famous passage in the New Testament about unity, talking about how as a church we're all members of one body. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And when I was in college, all of my friends would always talk about these passages, talking about how we're all members of one body, and why are we so divided? We should always be together, and it got me thinking, and I realized there's three unity passages in the New Testament. One of them is in Romans, right after the gifts of the Spirit, and the other one is in 1 Corinthians, and that's also right after the gifts of the Spirit. Different set of gifts. And then there's another one that's in Ephesians. And you know what? That comes right after another list of gifts. And all of a sudden I got to thinking. All my friends who are talking about how there must be unity in the body are talking about theological differences that divide us. And you know, Paul had some words to say about people who preached gospels that were false and not true. He was a very strong stickler on true doctrine. He divided people away that preached things that were not true. That wasn't at all what the unity he was talking about. He was talking about how God made us different, gifted us different, because we're all supposed to be different, and how he unites us together in church congregations, a whole bunch of different kinds of people, intentionally made differently so that we can work together and function together as a whole. We'll look at one of these here this morning in 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12. It says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. But the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. You ever think about all the different types of cells that you have in your body? got bone cells and they have a specific function and then you got muscle cells and they do something very differently but they're attached to the bone cells and you got red blood cells and you got liver cells and you got nerve cells and skin cells and pancreas cells and thyroid cells they figured out that there's about 200 different kinds of human cells and we're all every single one of them is a human cell but they all form up just a little differently from the same DNA source, and they function differently. They all have different types of purposes. 200 types of cells, and then your body has about 37 trillion of them assembled together. That's a lot of cells, isn't it? <laughs> and that's just the human ones. Then there's another 100 trillion bacteria cells that help your body function properly all of God's miraculous little sisters, the microcosmic realm. Anybody think about the pancreas cell yet today? <laughs> no, we don't even think about what that one does. But when you or someone you know discovers they have pancreatic cancer, all of a sudden the pancreas cells seem really important. I knew somebody who didn't even know what a pancreas was, and then his father-in-law got pancreatic cancer and was gone within a year, and he was like, it's a really important part of the body. Never think about that after 10th grade health class. You learn about the pancreas and the crazy islets of Langerhans do something or other. They're really important, actually, but we just assume it's going to do its thing without having to pay too much attention to it. I don't take care of my pancreas intentionally. I just kind of let it do its thing. So it is in the church. All kinds of different parts. Some of which we take for granted far too often until we're missing it. And then we're like, oh my goodness, that is a problem. Paul continues in verse 17 here. 
whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So as I alluded to earlier, there's three different lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. And you just need to remember the number 12, just like there were 12 sons of Jacob and 12 disciples, which became 12 apostles. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4, 12 where you find these. The list of spiritual gifts. In Romans 12, you have what I call the motivational gifts, because when somebody faces a crisis, you quickly learn what their motivation in life is and how the Holy Spirit gifted them to solve their crisis. Everybody approaches a problem differently. We see this sometimes at the dinner table. We see this sometimes in an auto mechanic shop. We see this sometimes in a classroom. Everybody jumps up and does something a little different. Learn from a mentor, example, Johnny spills his milk at the table. Now the first thing everybody does is they all go, oh. And then they spring into action. And the person with the leadership gifting, because that's one of the holy gifts of the Holy Spirit, they start standing by standing up and directing traffic. They're the first one to speak. And they'll be like, Ansley, go get a rag from the dishwasher or from the sink. And they'll be like, Elise, grab Johnny and pull him back from the table because he's getting milk on him. It's going on the floor. And they start telling everybody what to do because they naturally lead. Because God gifted them to lead. And then there's serving motivation. And that person's already gotten to the sink and has grabbed the washcloth because they just knew what needed to be done and they isolated the most critical task. And they've already grabbed it. It doesn't matter who if they were the one instructed to do it or not, they've already done it. They see something that needs to be done and they just step up and do it. Anybody know somebody like that in life? know lots of people. Some of you are pointing around spouses, things like that. Just do things. And then there's the person who's motivated to give. And they will grab their glass of milk and they will hand it to Johnny and say, here, I don't need my milk. You can have it. You lost yours. And the person who's got a teaching motivation will sit down and be like, all right, Johnny, so here's the thing. Your milk was sitting right next to the edge of the table by your plate. And so when you reach to grab your fork, you bumped into that glass of milk. And you know if your glass of milk is over here at the top of your plate and out of the way, and you get your fork on the one side and your knife on the other side, and you don't crash into your glass of milk, and you're just fine. Because teachers always teach their way out of every single problem and crisis. I'm guilty of that more often than not. All the time. Yes, we can relate. Now God has also motivated some people to be encouragers. And that person jumps up and comes next to Johnny and puts her hand around their shoulder and says, Johnny... Last week you spilled your milk three times, but it's already Friday this week, and this is the first time you spilled your milk. You're doing better. This isn't happening as often. I believe in you. You can do this. Next week you can get through the whole week. 21 meals, and you won't spill your milk once. I know it. Because that is how an encourager is. And then the mercy-oriented person, they come over to Johnny, and they're like, Oh, what, Johnny? It's okay. I spilled my milk when I was your age every single day. But I learned, I figured it out. Don't do it anymore. You know what? I can sympathize with you. I can empathize. I know how you're feeling. You don't need to feel so bad about yourself because everybody spills their milk. It's a stage we go through. 
And then there's the prophetically motivated person. <laughs> they have a really critical role in the body, but we don't always like running into them, especially when we're Johnny. And the prophetically motivated person stands up and says, Johnny, I told you you were going to do that. <laughs> you were to listen to me. You wanted to spill your milk. <laughs> You have enough children at the dinner table, and you can see these jumping out much more regularly. As long as as a parent you don't suppress it. Oh my gosh. That's just seven motivational gifts. God makes people differently, but you know that there's this multiplier effect, because we're not in Romans chapter 12. There's a similar passage there, it talks about different parts of the body. Now, we're in 1 Corinthians 12, and it's a different list of different spiritual gifts, supernatural ones, because God's Holy Spirit empowers us to be witnesses, and sometimes that means he gives us power to do something supernatural. And there are different supernatural gifts, and what Paul is telling the Corinthians in this particular passage is, some of you are going to prophesy, and some of you are going to have words of knowledge, and some of you are going to have miraculous powers, and others of you are going to have gifts of healing, and it doesn't matter who the Holy Spirit uses in what way, because he does it his way as he sees fit, you all have a different purpose. You ever run into a circumstance where you just need to hear the word of the Lord? You want to be around a prophetic person. You ever run into yourself, or run into a problem, and... You're like, I just don't even know what to do. You want to be around somebody who operates in the word of knowledge. You ever find yourself sick? You want to know somebody who's got gifts of healing. We can all pray for the sick. But I found there's some that are a lot more effective than others. And it's because the Holy Spirit gives them differently. You know, there's a third passage in Rome or Ephesians 4, 12. It talks about the ministry gifts. God gives people to be apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. And a great many of us are just simply workers in the kingdom of God. To do works of service, to do works of ministry. All kinds of different types of ministry. An apostolic ministry is very different than a pastoral ministry, which is very different than a teaching ministry. But just like David approached Goliath with five stones, God equipped his church with five different ministry gifts so that all the rest of us can be equipped for every good work of service, not just the pastoral ones, not just the teaching ones, so that everybody can be built up. Anybody like math? You shook your head first. So there's three different types of giftings, and you don't line them all up and be like, well, I got this one, so I don't get any of the rest of them. Because the way I see it playing out experientially in the kingdom is that a person will be motivated one way, will be granted another supernatural gift, and they'll have some other ministry type of gift. So there's a lot of different combinations that can come together. So if there's seven motivational gifts, and nine supernatural gifts, and then six ministry gifts, how many combos is that, Bob? Seven times nine times six. Three hundred and seventy-eight, just about there. Do you know that in our small church, we don't even have the chance of having 10% of those combinations present? Because there's 378 different combinations. God puts us all together differently, all uniquely. Then you add on top of that are different temperaments or different personalities or different Myers-Briggs chart options. The fact that we're made male and female and we don't choose that one, it's given to us and 
fact that we all come from different generations and that people from the greatest generation operated one way and people from the boomers are different and millennials are very different and Gen Z is yet to be fully discovered. And all of a sudden you realize that God has an amazing amount of variety built right into his church. For a purpose. But we're all part of one body, one congregation. Paul continues developing this theme in verse 21. It says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Every church congregation is essentially a team that is assembled, a team of people that have different skill sets, different ministry giftings, and different personalities, and different life experiences, and God puts us together to work together. You ever watch the movie Cars? Lightning McQueen has heavily influenced our household. But in the very first Cars movie, he learns a really important lesson through the course of the movie. As Mackay would say, he has a really well-developed character arc. Because at the beginning of the movie, his crew quits on him and runs off, and the press are asking him, well, what do you think about your crew chief? And Lightning McQueen responds, like, you know, I'm kind of a one-man show. I don't really need them. And guess what he learns through the course of the movie? He needs all of them. And so at the end of the movie, when he's racing his last race of the movie, he has Guido there who can change tires ridiculously fast. And he needed that. And he has Fillmore who can fill him up with awesome gas. And he has Doc there as the crew chief who's telling him what he needs to do while he's driving around the race course. And he's got Mater there because everybody needs a friend. He learned being a race car driver is not a one-man show. The driver obviously usually gets more of the glory and more of the attention, but there's a crew, there's a team, a racing team necessary to run a successful race. And in the same way, no church is a one-person show. It's a team. God assembles, and rearranges from time to time, everybody working together. continues in verse 23. It says, On those parts of the body we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. Through the course of our life, we all learn that all of our body parts are important. We tend to spend more time dealing with a face. It gets a lot of sunshine, and it gets an awful lot of attention, especially in the morning. Shaving, manicuring, changing things a little bit here and there. There are other parts of our body that get less daylight, but they're just as important. And families, I've learned, have different ways that they talk about these parts with special modesty. And in our house, we use the term Rumperschnickel. <laughs> Everybody has a rumperschnickel. There's a lot of crass, rude, and crude terms that are out there, and so we just invented one that has none of those associations. You need a rumperschnickel. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's a good deal. Less, <laughs> less daylight. <laughs> I have to compose myself here. <laughs> church body, not everybody is the face of the church. 
there are some people that have to clean the porcelain throne where you sit on your rubber schnitzel. <laughs> we have a couple of those in the church. One just started yesterday. You know, those are very essential roles that we don't often think about and we take for granted, but it's absolutely critical. Now, this morning we were treated to listening to Bob Jones and his melodies on his guitar, and his skills always astound me. You know, if he wasn't here on a Sunday morning after three months, we would certainly miss him, and we would talk about the good old days when Bob Jones was able to play amazing guitar and blessed to such. But do you know that if we went three months without somebody cleaning the toilets, we would start having problems. There would be committees meeting. <laughs> there would be discussions about things that need to take place because that is a very critical role. Now, it doesn't get much daylight. Many of you probably don't know who does that in the church. And fewer of you know the new person who just started learning yesterday. But you know, it's a very critical role. As are some of the other more hidden parts. The person who mows the lawn, the people that get the leaves off the grass, take them down to compost. And on a Sunday morning, I may be up here on the stage, but I wouldn't sound very good or look very good, and nothing would be on there if it wasn't for the person in the back. It's a very critical behind the scenes role. But also on a Sunday morning, it's the person who makes the coffee, it's the person who delivers the donuts, it's the guys who count the money. There's the people who deposit the tithes and offerings later on in the week. All these different roles and responsibilities and functions, some are more public, some are more private, all equally important. Just like your body has a whole bunch of different parts, some of which get more daylight, others of which get less daylight, they're all important and have specific, special roles that God designed into us. And one of the interesting things that our family watched and learned as we were on sabbatical, we were visiting other churches, we got to see different parts that other churches had. And one of the things that just astounded me at one church we visited is they had a crossing guard to make sure we didn't get run over before we made it to the front door. It was like, I hadn't thought about that part. And then there were two people there to open the door for us. It was like, wow, oh, that's really nice. That reminds me of when I was in high school and somebody opened the door for me at St. John's Lutheran Church in Owatonna for a special youth conference that was going on. It's like, I am something else. Two guys that are 70 years older than me are opening the door for me to walk into this building. Talk about welcoming. And then there was a person that handed out the bulletin to us. And then there was another person who got us acquainted with where everything was in the facility. And then there was a security guy. And he actually was a uniformed officer with the police department. And I was like, wow, that guy is publicly packing heat because I can see his Glock right on his hip. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it impacts the way you feel. Since he's got a badge, it's not nearly as scary. All kinds of different parts that God can assemble. All equally important. Some get more limelight, others get less limelight. We all work together. I encourage you to think about your role, your place in the body. How is it you fit in? How is it God has gifted you? you don't know how God has gifted you, talk to me. I've got ways of evaluating that, sorting out, narrowing down the options. If you were at the table and Johnny spilled his milk, how would you respond? But let's give glory to God for making us each different, and let's give gratitude to one another for everybody's contributions, whether we've taken them for granted in the past, or whether we Thank them also. This is the month for giving thanksgiving. This is the month for showing gratitude. As we gather as a body, we can do that. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how you have gifted each and every one of us. How you have designed us, put us together, and knit us together in our mother's wombs so that there is only one of us. That we are unique. 
And Lord, we thank you for the ways that we have learned to work together. And we pray you'd help us as we grow in our ability to work together as an effective team, as an effective body of your believers, shining the light of the gospel in our community. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd be helping us to honor and respect those who have different roles from us in the church, that you'd help us to not take for granted those things that are unseen and behind the scenes. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'd help us to just grow in our ability to shine your light in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit continuing to reveal how you fit together in the body.